not. Well, some of you already know our guest speaker. He's been here before, Pastor Daniel Kaffenberger. He's retired now, retired from the uh, Harrison District, which is, what, west of us. But, you know, a retired pastor never really retires. He's just, what, re-threaded? Is that how we put it? Go about it at another different way. And so uh, he's gonna, I'm going to invite him to come up. He's going to be joined by his uh, wife, Mary Ann. Uh, you know, they're doing things a little different now, but it's still the gospel truth, the gospel message. So give your ear and heart and mind to his message this morning. Dan. The true saying is, a minister never retires. He just goes out to pastor. <laughs> we are glad to be here today. We want to pray once more. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we open up your word, Lord, as we open up devotional books and we see what is said, help us to think about what we're hearing because it's you talking to us. Beth just sang a song and it says, when you hear the call, when you hear the call, are you ready to answer the call? Many are called, but few are chosen. But we're asking you, Lord, if you have already called us, that we've responded to the call. And if you are calling us, Lord, that we do respond to the call. Help us, Lord, to hear your word in all the studies we do and to meditate on them, think about them, what they have to do with us. Whether it's Old Testament or new, whether it's a new devotional, Help us to think about what we're hearing and what you'd like us to do for you. So we thank you for this. We ask your blessings upon opening your word today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Mary Ann and I <clears throat> are not going to push baptism today, but we're going to talk about it. I feel it's important. And we're not going to push uh, getting rid of old habits like tobacco, but you're going to hear it in the sermon today. I'm not pushing the fact of you getting your life straight, even though you should, but I want you to think of commitment today, what it means to be committed. So I just hope you get that out of this sermon, even though you hear other things don't make them the majority of the sermon. Think back to me asking you if you are committed. Amen. Sometimes I will wake up on a Monday or a Tuesday and inform my dear wife I don't have a sermon. And with my sight and other problems, I'm not sure where to find a sermon. And the Lord blesses right then and there because this dear lady reads about three devotionals every morning as we start our day. And one of those devotionals will just form a sermon in my head. And I want you to hear this devotional that was written by Eric B. Herrick. And it was on the war while he was overseas. And what they were going through to stay away from the war. And yet what happens, as soon as my wife had read it to me, and like I just asked you to meditate, I meditate on it and I told her I have a sermon. The sermon is not just the devotional, but the devotional gave me the sermon you're going to hear today. Amen. Praise God. So this is about Eric B. Hare. And it says, during the early months of World War II, five of us missionaries were fleeing to the border of India in two cars. As we left the town of Pakaku, Pastor Christensen waved us to a stop at the side of the road. So we pulled up behind him and went to see what was the trouble. We found him talking with a well-to-do Indian woman and her family. And she was saying, oh, pastor, this is the way you said the end of the world would be. No one can tell whether he will live to see another day 
won't you take me to the river and baptize me now? And then I would feel that all is well with my soul. And I heard Pastor Christensen say, it is too late now, dear lady. It is too late now. Can't you remember? Six weeks ago, I was kneeling in your home with you and your children, pleading that the Spirit of God would help you to make your decision then. You had been coming to meetings. You knew our message is right, but you wanted to wait for others to take their stand. And now we are fleeing for our lives. We will pray that God will bring you safely into India so that we can study and get ready for baptism then. But then I saw that well-to-do Indian woman sink to the ground, cover her face with her sari as she sobbed. Too late. Why didn't I get baptized six weeks ago? And now it's too late. It is impossible to forget things like that. Is God's spirit speaking to your heart today? Do you hear him warning you of some sin or pleading for you to make some important decision. You need to do it now. Someday the harvest will be past. The summer ended, and it will be too late. We want to open to our, in our Bibles to the story in Matthew, chapter 26. So if you want to open to your Bibles, Matthew 26, verses 20 through 24. And this is the story of Judas at the Lord's Supper. And Jesus was letting Judas know that he knew what Judas was about to do. So we're going to read Matthew 26, 20 through 24. And it reads, Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. Do you believe that Judas had been baptized? Yes. As one of the members or one of the apostles of Jesus, we believe that all the apostles were baptized. Will baptism save you? No. No. But not being baptized when you should, could that lose you? Yes. But this lady, and Mary Ann's going to say it again, this lady now wanted to be baptized out of fear, not conviction. She was convicted six weeks earlier, but put it off. And now seeing the war and seeing what was happening, she wanted baptism out of fear. Is that a good reason to be baptized? No, no it should always come from being convicted from your personal conviction that what you're hearing is the truth and you want to follow it. So here we have an apostle that Jesus knows is going to betray him, says he's going to betray him. What do you think Judas is thinking right about now? Interesting, isn't it? What would you be thinking? Mary Ann's going to continue. In our opening story, baptism needed to be done because it should follow repentance. But the woman had not fouled or allowed conversion in her heart. She had heard the good news but let it go, and now she requested baptism out of fear. So you may ask the question, why be baptized? You know, children get baptized sometimes because other children, their friends, are being baptized, or because they are of an age to be baptized. And adults can make up their own reasons why they should be baptized. And maybe there is some pressure for adults to be baptized. But what is the best reason? As Pastor said, you are to be convicted by the truth. True baptism is a result of a conversion experience. Let us turn in our Bibles to the book of Acts 2. Acts chapter 2. 
and we want verse 38. Acts 2, verse 38. And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So we are not pushing for anyone to get baptized today. We are encouraging you to surrender your heart to God before you hear the words, it is too late. We need to surrender our heart, our time, our money before it is too late. We need to surrender whatever separates you from following God all the way, all the time. There's a quote that we'd like to read to you from Patriarchs and Prophets. It's on page 98, and it's about the story of Noah. And it reads, Mercy had ceased its pleadings for the guilty race. And so when Christ shall cease his intercession for guilty men, before his coming in the clouds of heaven, the door of mercy will be shut. And then divine grace will no longer restrain the wicked, and Satan will have full control of those who have rejected mercy. They will endeavor to destroy God's people, but as Noah was shut into the ark, so the righteous will be shielded by divine power. For seven days after Noah and his family entered the ark, there appeared no sign of the coming storm. During this period, their faith was tested. It was a time of triumph to the world without. The apparent delay confirmed them in the belief that Noah's message was a delusion and that the flood would never come. But notwithstanding the solemn scenes which they had witnessed, the beasts and the birds entering the ark, and the angel of God closing the door, they still continued their sport and fun, even making a jest of these signal manifestations of God's power. They gathered in crowds about the ark, deriding its inmates with a daring violence which they had never ventured upon before. So, this is talking about two miracles. It's talking about the animals coming in in pairs into the ark with, without anybody pulling them or tying a rope around their necks. They were guided by God to come into the ark. And then they saw the door shut, which had to have been huge, too big for a man to close. And yet they saw it close. And yet we might hear people say today, if I could just see a miracle. Are you with me? If I could just see a miracle, then I'd know what to do. Did these people see miracles? Did it move them to do what was right? No. So is a miracle something that you can have happen to you that would guarantee you're doing what's right? No. And how do we know this? Because the Bible itself says even the devil and his angels can do miracles. You do not want to base what you believe on miracles. You do not want to base it on what other people even say. You need to have your commitment based on what God says. In the Bible, when you hear the truth preached, when you hear it preached, is that a call? Yes. Is that the time to answer? And too many people put it off. They say, I see what you're saying, Pastor, and I see what you're saying that it does fit in the Bible. But my parents, my grandparents, my children, my wife, my husband, when I hear something like that, what text do I think of? I think of a text that didn't make sense when I first read it. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And I'm thinking, why does God not want us to love our parents? It's the fact we put what they say above what God has said. And we do what our parents say instead of following the commitment that we should follow and do what God wants us to do. 
We have an example of that in Acts, the book of Acts uh, 26, chapter 26. And if you turn with me to there. Acts 26, 27 through 29. And this is Paul speaking to King Agrippa. 27 starts out, King Agrippa, believest thou the prophets? I know that thou believest. And then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And 29, and Paul said, I would to God that not only thou, but also all that hear me this day, were both almost and all together, such as I am, except for these bonds. This is Paul talking to you today. All that hear me this day. The words have been written down so that we can hear them over and over again. What did Agrippa say to him? Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. It's interesting, as Paul's talking to this man, he knows this man. He knows what he believes. He says, believe us the prophets? I know you do. Isn't this interesting? Does he already know the scriptures? Yes, but is he convicted enough to follow what he has heard? And the answer is actually yes. He's heard enough about Christianity to say to Paul, almost thou persuadest me. But he is persuaded. He's just not answering the call. And turn to me with me to Second Timothy two fifteen. Second Timothy two fifteen. And this one says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Will you only want to follow God when we see that the world is coming apart? It's too late. The signs are already here. Wars and rumors of war. Does it need to get worse for you to commit yourself to God? That's the wrong reason. It should come out of love. You should be driven by love and not fear. Let's turn to John 14:15. Go back to John 14, 15. So you remember in the opening story, uh, Christensen, the pastor, pastor, tells her that you knew this was the truth when you heard it. She did. Why? How does he know? He visited her in the house. And then he prayed and prayed the Holy Spirit can convict her. But she's now being convicted by the war not the grace. You and I need to join out of faith through God's grace to us because he's long-suffering and waiting for us to make a decision, not just in baptism, brothers and sisters, not just in what we're doing wrong to start doing right, but the conviction to be his 100% and do whatever he asks us to do. So John 14, 15, a short verse. If you love me, keep my commandments. You know the angels want to see the conflict ended. They want to see the followers of Christ in heaven. Their question today could be, how long are you going to take before you commit your ways to the Lord? So are you faithfully studying the word of God every day? Let us turn for an answer in 1 Peter 3.15. 1 Peter 3.15. Now, Marianne just read a text to you. You read it along with her, I hope. Study to show yourself approved. Is this the word of God? Is he talking to you? What is he telling you in the Bible to do? Study. But how often and how long do you study? 
That's the question you need to ask when you hear God make a statement like this. Study, brothers and sisters. Study. Well, I do, five minutes a day. And you're getting ready for heaven. Is that right? <laughs> I don't think so. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what's it mean to sanctify God in your heart? What does it mean, the word sanctify mean? Set apart for holy use. So what is this text asking you to do with your heart? Fall in love with the world? No. Set it apart for holy use. And who wants to use your heart? God does. So according to this text in 1 Peter, if I were to ask you a question on the 28 fundamental beliefs, would you be ready to give an answer? And if you couldn't give an answer, when are you thinking of studying so you could give an answer if someone asked you about your faith? You know, we have a new book published, The 28 Fundamental Beliefs. And using your Bible and the book, could you explain what you believe? Are these 28 fundamental beliefs important to you? If we don't know and we don't follow God's word now, why would he want to take us to heaven? Eternity is going to be a never-ending life of service to God. And this earthly life is the preparation for that life. As Pastor was working on this sermon, he was thinking of something else that encourages us to be blessed by. That is the songbook in your pew. We're going to go through some hymns. Do you sing the hymns? Okay. As you're singing the hymns, are the words coming out of your mouth. So you're personally saying this. Are you saying it to God seriously? Listen to this as you and I take your hymnal. We're going to go through some hymns, and I'm going to share with you what you believe. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. What you believe. Our first hymn we want to look through is number 327, and we're going to read the first verse, hymn number 327. First verse. And the title is, I'd Rather Have Jesus. So the first verse goes, I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be his than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. So if I heard you in a conversation, would I hear about Jesus or about how you've been blessed with money? Would I be hearing about Jesus or hearing that you just brought and bought some more property with a house on it and you're telling how much money you're going to make by the rent you're going to get from the house? Are you with me? I'm not putting down life. I'm just sharing with you. The most important thing to you should be Jesus. And if he is, he should be the most important conversation you have. Our next hymn is number 196. Hymn number 196. And we're going to... Just read the first two lines of this one. Tell me the old, old story. So the first verse goes, Tell me the old, old story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. But you may say to Pastor, Pastor, I'm tired of Bible stories and sermons. And he'll ask you, why is that? And you'll say, Oh, it's just not interesting anymore. And he may ask you, what is interesting to you? Playing games on your tablet? 
your phone, your iPad, your computer, will this prepare you for heaven? That's the important question. What you're doing in life today, is it preparing you for heaven? Is it preparing you for the trials that we're about to go through before Jesus comes? How many here in Adventists say, I just wish Jesus had come? Somebody tell me, what are they wishing? They're wishing that the time of trouble would come. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Does it have to come before he comes? Yes. Are you ready for the time of trouble? Yes, do we want to see Jesus come? Yes. Of course we do. But is there a promised time of trouble before he comes? Yes. Am I seriously ready for the time of trouble so that I'm ready for Jesus to come? I just want to share a hymn with you, another one, but we're not going to look it up. If it stays in my mind. I'm ready for Jesus to come. Are you ready for Jesus to come? But I'm changing my hymn. I know it's a beautiful hymn, but I'm changing mine to, I want to be ready when Jesus comes, to I want to be ready when probation closes. Do you know why? Because the time of trouble comes when probation closes. If you're not ready when Jesus leaves the sanctuary, you will not be ready. And that goes right back to this Indian lady. It's too late. When the time of trouble starts coming, you will not get ready for Jesus' second coming because it's sealed, brothers and sisters. The wicked are wicked and the righteous are righteous. There's no one changing sides or getting ready for their side. It's a done deal. So even that song that says, I want to be ready when Jesus comes. I love the song, but in my mind I sing, I want to be ready when probation closes. I want to be ready when Jesus leaves the heavenly sanctuary. So if there's Adventists waiting for the Sunday laws and there's Adventists waiting for certain things to happen that they know are in the Bible, is that a good thing? No. What should we get ready for Jesus with? We should get rid ready with our commitment while things are the way they are today. This lady wanted baptism when she saw the war get close to home. Brothers and sisters, when the time of trouble comes, you will not get ready for baptism. You won't even get ready for heaven if you haven't done it before that time. We have another hymn, it's number 322. 322, nothing between. And we're going to read the second verse. 322, the second verse. Nothing between, like worldly pleasure, habits of life, though harmless they seem, must not my heart from him ever sever. He is my all. There's nothing between. Worldly pleasure. Has that got a hold of a lot of people today? Do not let it get a hold of you. These are hymns you sing, is that right? These are well-known songs. But when we're singing, do we really realize what we're saying to God. I visit a Methodist church because my daughter plays there. And it's amazing, sometimes before the pastor starts the sermon, he said, let's pray together. And do you know what they pray? The Our Father. And do you know how many people will pray the Our Father and not know what they're saying to God? It says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then what's it say? Our daily bread 
and forgive me, Dan, my sins if I forgive others that sin against me. Do people today have grudges? <laughs> Do people today have hatred? If they pray the Our Father, they're asking God, do not forgive me of my sins if I do not forgive my brother and sister. Can we have grudges in the church? <laughs> we shouldn't. Very good. If you have an enemy that you could think of right now, praying the Our Father or even knowing what the Our Father means, can you ask God to forgive your sins while you're holding grudges and sins against others? No, you're actually asking God, don't forgive me unless I've forgiven my brother and sister. That's quite the prayer, isn't it? And yet how many times do we hear people praying the Our Father and have no idea that because they're holding a grudge or hatred or anything else, they're asking God not to forgive their own sins. So not only the hymns, but the prayer that Jesus gave us has not hidden, but they could be hidden, little lines in there that are telling us, if I'm not right with others, Lord, I'm not right with you. Is that true? Yes. Love God and love your neighbor. Jesus goes farther and says, love your enemies. This is why. Because God's going to judge your love according to his love. You want God's love? Yes. He wants to see his love come out of you. May God bless you with that thought. We have one more hymn, number 508. Number 508, the first verse. Anywhere with Jesus, I can safely go. Anywhere he leads me in this world below. Anywhere without him, dearest joys would fade. Anywhere with Jesus, I am not afraid. So where is Jesus going to lead you? Is he going to lead you to be doing your own thing on the Sabbath? Is he going to lead you to a ball game or a sport event on Sabbath? What does his word say? Let's turn to Isaiah 58, 13. Isaiah 58 and verse 13. I think we read this in Sabbath school. Isaiah 58, verse 13, it says, If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, and shall honor him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. So are you serious, pastor, <laughs> about us preparing for heaven by what we do here on earth? You know in Isaiah 66, it says that we're going to come before God from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath day to another. All flesh, it says in that verse, is going to come before him from one Sabbath day to another. Yes. Now someone says to me, so, Pastor, tell me, why is it so important that I go to church? Do you want to know what my crazy answer is? It's practice. Yes. Are you with me? Mm. If we are going to go before God every Sabbath day in heaven, shouldn't we practice now? Amen. I don't want you to miss this. If the Bible says all flesh will go, all flesh will go, then we should want to go today. Not out of fear, not out of demand. How many want to be like Jesus? 
Where did he go every Sabbath? Synagogue. To the synagogue, which was in his day the church. Was it the true church? Amen. Were they preaching good in it? Amen. No. Were they preaching good in it? Was he preaching good in it? Yes. Right. yes. Were they preaching the true gospel message? No. no. Did he go anyway? So I'm not going to church because I don't like the way pastor preaches. Are you with me? Should Jesus have gone to the synagogue? Not if the preaching was bad. And then when he preaches, what do they do to him? They grabbed him by the armpits to throw him off a cliff. And he disappeared. But the unique thing is, where did he go next Sabbath? same place. I hear people say, I'm not going there anymore. They don't like the way my hair is combed. They grab Jesus by the armpits to throw him off a cliff, and he went to church the next Sabbath. We have the oddest reasons not to go to church. And I heard it during Sabbath school, a flat tire. Somebody said, I had a flat tire, but I owned three cars. Are you with me? I think I should fix the flat. I think I need to go to church because I'm getting ready for Isaiah 66. Amen. All flesh is going to come before God on the Sabbath. Is it going to be out of fear? Is it going to be out of force? No, are we going to love to do it? That's right. So should we get used to it now? Amen. Amen. So what will it take for us to get serious about our knowledge of God's word and our commitment to him? Here's a story about Ellen White and Elder White, and they were holding some meetings in a little church at Washington, New Hampshire. Again and again, they were making appeals to the juniors and the young people. There was one young man there who didn't respond. And the real reason was that he knew his father chewed tobacco, even though he was the church choir leader. Now listen to as Mary Ann's going. She's talking about Ellen White and James White were preaching. And they were preaching to the youth. Now listen to what this young man is making his decision based on. So the father of this young boy had managed to keep his bad habit of chewing tobacco a secret from the church people. But as the boy worked with his father, he knew very well what made those brown spots on the snow where his father spit. At the Sabbath morning service, Mrs. White was appealing to the church members to mend their ways and obey the voice of the Lord. And the young man said to himself, Oh, I wish she would speak to my father and tell him about his sin. I am sure no one has told her. Are you with me? This young man is basing his conviction to stand for Jesus according to what he sees his father doing. He needs a miracle right now, and he asks for one. He said, I wish Ellen White would tell my father. What is odd about this request, Pastor? Ellen White always corrected people through letters. Are you with me? One on one. But in this case, a young man's soul is at risk. So listen to what happens. So the young man said to himself, I wish she would speak to my father and tell him about his sin. I am sure no one has told her. And just then, Mrs. White turned to the boy's father and said, in effect, Brother, I was shown your case. You are a slave of tobacco. And then she went on to describe how he had tried to hide his sin. And the face of the young man lit up. And she, he said to himself, Only an angel could have told her that. Indeed, this message is from God. So God was with them. 
Many of the older members confessed their sins, and 13 young people took their stand for Christ. To show you how earnest they were about it, they wanted to be baptized right then, in the middle of winter. The river was frozen. They had to cut through two feet of ice to get to the water, and the temperature outside was a minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> But 12 of those young people were baptized and suffered no e ill effects, and most of them became workers in God's cause. Is that conviction? Yes. And all because a young man's soul was debating over his father's sin. Because normally, when you read any of her writings, she writes a letter to tell somebody what they're doing's wrong. But in this case, God shows her she must tell this man in front of the church what he's doing wrong in order to convict his son. So it's a powerful story, brothers and sisters. Would you like to be the son? Mm. Would you like to be the choir director? <laughs> When she told this man what he had been doing, the next line, Mary Ann says, when they closed their meeting, many of the people, not the youth, the people, confessed their sins. Do you think that's also because they saw this man's sin pointed out to him? Mm -hmm. I do too. I think the whole group was being convicted by what they saw, what they heard, and the final results of that meeting. Amen. Can you imagine two feet of ice? Now let's make this personal. Can you imagine two feet of ice? It's minus 10 out, and pastor has 10 people or 12 people to baptize. Is that personal? <laughs> would you do it? Yes, he would. <laughs> Oh, I shouldn't have done that, but I just had to. So as God looks at you today, does he see some secret sin that is spoiling your Christian life? Something that nobody knows about but you. If we read our opening scripture again, it says in Jeremiah 8.20, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. We need to mend our ways and our doings right now, or we will hear the words, it is too late. It is too late. It's a powerful sermon, isn't it? I'm hoping it cuts to your heart that if you aren't right with God in all ways, you'll get right with God. If you need help, if you need prayers, you have a good pastor to ask him to help in whatever way. If you need text, if you need stories out of the Bible, it's interesting today, have people put little machinery in place of their Bible today? Yes. I heard a sermon of a pastor preaching, and the people had their, their phones out. Can you bring up the Bible on your phone? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and this pastor just said one thing, I hope you have the right Bible today. He didn't mean King James. He says, I hope you have the right Bible today, one that won't ding or ring and take you away from the sermon. Is that a good way to be pulled away from the sermon thoughts? Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if one rang while I was preaching? You might be wondering why Betty got a call, hopefully there's no Betty here, why Betty got a call, your mind is now thinking about the call instead of the call from God. Amen. So I hope you will stick with your Bible. And if you're using your phone, that somehow you don't get distracted and end up leaving to talk to somebody or something. Will Satan use anything he can to get you out of a sermon? Amen. Yes, he will. I preached a sermon in Harrison, and I used this as part of my sermon. And lo and behold, and pastor will agree with me, I hope, 
of all the phones in the church to ring. It was a phone of a visitor. And I was up front, and I says, do you mute your phones, or do you want to be disturbed? And right then, his phone rang. And all I could think of is to find out who asked him to come to church. And I found out it was a member's husband. And I went to her and I said, I hope I haven't embarrassed him. And of all the answers I got, this lady said, my husband is so sorry that he was the fulfillment of your sermon. Not because he'll never come to church again, but because you were right. He loved the way you were preaching, but he had to go out in the foyer in order to talk to his friend. But you want to hear the blessing? Anybody? Yes, yes. He told his friend never to call him at that time again. <laughs> May God bless you. Be committed to God. And if sins come up in your mind, brothers and sisters, don't think you'll take care of them tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come. Amen. It's right now that you need to make things right. Amen. God bless you. Let us all stand and we'll sing 322, nothing between.